Hello, I'm Christina Davis, Director of the Program on U.S.-Japan Relations. I'm so glad to see a full room here to honor our guest. We are here to hear the Distinguished Visitor Lecture by Haruhiko Kuroda, who is the program's Distinguished Visitor for this year and is going to speak to us about macroeconomic policy, inflation targeting in Japan. Every year we honor an individual who has made an extraordinary impact on US-Japan relations and the program's research areas on the Japanese economy, politics, and society. And today we honor an individual who has truly been a giant in impacting um, both Japan and the world through his innovative policies as a leading banker for Japan and global finance. During the time of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, many of us heard and studied a set of policies that were referred to as Abenomics. These were a core strategy to help spur economic growth in Japan after decades of low growth, after the bursting of the bubble. These policies included three arrows, fiscal expansion, monetary policy, and structural reform. A very creative uh, naming of policy that um, has since been imitated by other countries as well. But Abenomics was an original policy set and Mr. Kuroda was the architect of the second arrow of Abenomics focused on monetary expansion. These unorthodox policies of monetary expansion have really set a new standard for creativity in banking policy. Indeed, the Wall Street Journal economic columnist Greg Ipp referred to them as a gigantic experiment in monetary <laughs> policy. And it takes a lot of courage as a central banker to do something new. I think central banking is known as a cautious area of policy making. And to come in and really shake up what is expected um, took a lot of courage and willingness to um, make changes. So over a decade of his service as the governor of the Bank of Japan from 2013 to 2023, Mr. Kuroda oversaw the policies of quantitative and qualitative easing in order to shape inflation expectations and stimulate the Japanese economy. During this period, the Bank of Japan purchased an equivalent of $11.7 trillion worth of bonds, stock funds, and corporate debt, and adopted a negative interest rate policy. This governorship completely reshaped our thinking about monetary and central banking policies. At the G20 meeting that was held in India this past fe February, near the end of his term, he received a standing ovation from central bankers of all G20 countries and finance ministers, all standing to recognize his important contribution to global financial stability. Over the past years, the Bank of Japan has continued to resist raising interest rates, <laughs> even as um, inflation has indeed become the new problem. And other banks have tried to fight inflationary pressures by repeatedly raising interest rates. Now, in part as a consequence of this gap, the yen has weakened to the rate of 150 yen to the dollar, causing troubles for the associates of the program in U.S. Japan, right? <laughs> here with salaries paid in yen and living in high-priced Boston. So I think our associates may have some rather pointed questions. <laughs> um, but we are all quite interested in the policy legacy of your years as Bank of Japan governor. And, you know, now your successor, uh, Bank of Japan governor Kazuo Ueda, faces um, questions and expectations about when and how the Bank of Japan can shift its policy orientation. So we are really very excited to have this moment to hear from you as the architect of these policies. And because you are now a professor mm -hmm. at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Tokyo, you may be able to speak with a little bit more freedom <laughs> than when you were Bank of Japan governor. <laughs> 
And of course, you bring to your position as professor long experience, not only as Bank of Japan governor, but also as someone who served in the Ministry of Finance since 1967, including positions as vice minister of finance for international affairs and as president of the Asian Development Bank from 2005 to 2013, which included the window of the financial crisis where your policies as the Asian Development Bank president helped to indeed triple the activities of the Asian Development Bank, helping the region to recover from a great financial crisis. And you have had such a wide range of experience that we really look forward to hearing from you today. And it's not only the program, but also many co-sponsors who bring you here to Harvard. <laughs> so I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the special series of Japanese economic statecraft, the Harvard Kennedy School, the Harvard Kennedy School of Japan Caucus, the Harvard Undergraduate Japan Policy Network, and the Japan Society of Boston. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Kuroda, the program's distinguished visitor. We have asked him to speak for about 30 minutes, and following this, we will open up for questions to end around one o'clock. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much indeed for your kind introduction, Christina. Uh, I am very much uh, uh, honored to be here to speak about uh, monetary policy in the last uh, 10 years. But uh, before going into the 10 year uh, monetary policy uh, in the framework of QQE or quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, why we introduced uh, such a expansionary uh, monetary policy in 2013? is uh, we would like to uh, overcome 15 year deflation from 1998 through 2012. So you can see the Japan's uh, consumer price increase and nominal wage increase in the last uh, uh, 25 years or so. And from 1998 through well, you can see uh, consumer prices uh, were almost always in the negative range, and uh, waging, uh, the wage wage increase was uh, in, in larger negative range. I just uh, calculated the average uh, inflation rate in the 15 year uh, <coughs> deflationary period. And I found that it's uh, only minus 0.3%. So it's a very mild deflation, but uh, within uh, 15 years time, almost 10 years had negative uh, deflation. And then wages declined on average by 0.9%, nearly 1% annually. So this was really uh, mild but the persistent deflation coupled with uh, continuously declining nominal wages. And during that time, unemployment rate was about 5%. Uh, in the Japanese context, uh, 5% uh, unemployment rate is quite high. After we introduced uh, Expansion and monetary policy, <laughs> unemployment rate to decline roughly two and a half percent or something. Like that. So, really, uh, this uh, deflation was, uh, uh, if not created, but coincided with uh, declining uh, wages and the increased unemployment. And uh, during that time, uh, <clears throat> As usual, Japanese companies uh, retained uh, full-time uh, uh, workers, but uh, uh, refrained from uh, recruiting uh, university graduates. Uh, so that uh, in this 15-year uh, time, you are called 
in Japanese uh, Kyushoku Hyogaki, in English uh, interpretation is uh, something like uh, Ice Age for Job Seekers. <laughs> so, Bank of Japan decided uh, 10 percent, uh, so, sorry, uh, 2 percent inflation target in 2013. Actually, January 2013, that is before I became governor of the Bank of Japan. So Bank of Japan itself uh, decided uh, to introduce a 2% inflation target. And at the same time, they argue that the 2% uh, uh, inflation target uh, should be met uh, not as soon as possible, but uh, uh, more, what you say, urgent uh, kind of uh, time span at the earliest possible time. So Bank of Japan, even before I became a uh, governor, committed itself to achieve 2% inflation target uh, uh, quite, quite soon. Then I became uh, governor of Japan. <laughs> Uh, in uh, as he said, uh, 2013 uh, May uh, March, and we introduced uh, so-called QCD, quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, uh, in April 2013. They call that. Uh, 2% differential target was adopted by the Bank of Japan and included a joint statement by Bank of Japan and the Japanese governments in January 2013. And at that time, the uh, nine member policy board was divided. Seven members supported the introduction of 2% inflation target, but two members uh, Disagreed. So when I became governor of the Bank of Japan, we discussed uh, this issue uh, very much. And uh, eventually, nine members agreed to introduce uh, quantitative and qualitative monetary easing to achieve the 2% inflation target at the earliest possible time. By the way, during that the discussion, we utilized the macroeconomic model. It's a kind of uh, reverse engineering, how to <laughs> achieve 2% inflation target within two years time. Then we use macroeconomic model, then how much and what kind of uh, uh, monetary easing was necessary. And so this was a very interesting exercise. Uh, but anyway, uh, with uh, uh, unanimous support, the QQE was introduced in April 2013. And the immediate uh, reaction was quite positive. Uh, inflation rate uh, becomes uh, actually Spring 2014, uh, reaching 1.4% uh, percent. Uh, and uh, also economic growth recovered, stock market rebounded. So everything appeared to be quite uh, quite okay. So at that time we thought that probably within two years time we can achieve two percent inflation target. But unfortunately, uh, inflation rate went up, but the nominal rate increase was lagging behind rate increase, uh, uh, inflation uh, rate, so that the real wages declined and the consumption was 
very weak. Uh, on top of that, uh, consumption tax rate was raised from 5% to 8% in April 2014. So that again, prices uh, uh, declined. So we expanded the QQE in October 2014. And uh, Substantially increased uh, JG purchases uh, with longer term maturities and committing high, higher increase of wage money. Then situation still improving, but again, unfortunately, uh, then oil prices, which had been around $100 per barrel, uh, declined toward $50 per barrel in 2015. <clears throat> and reached less than $30 per barrel in early 2016, reducing the CPI uh, inflation rate to zero. So the situation required the bank to further strengthen the monetary easing significantly. <clears throat> so we introduced the negative interest rate in January 2016. Of course, uh, negative interest rate uh, policy had been introduced in many European central banks, including the ECB, uh, but it was not very popular because it tended to reduce uh, banking sector uh, uh, profitability and, uh, and the banking sector activities have been negatively affected by the negative interest rate policy. So uh, Bank of Japan introduced uh, negative interest rate in January 2016, but with uh, important uh, ramifications. We uh, made three drops uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, deposit at the central bank uh, and uh, try to avoid the negative impact on the banking sector. So it was, uh, in some sense, quite uh, successful uh, in providing uh, quite low, uh, short to medium interest rate, uh, making the, the monetary policy more expansionary. Than but uh, the market, uh, initially responded quite positively, but uh, the, again, we had some problems, uh, partly because of uh, Chinese yuan depreciation and so on and so forth. So then we introduced uh, uh, real card control in September 2016, after carefully assessing the impact of QQE, as well as negative interest rate uh, policy on the economy and uh, financial situation. And we discussed, decided to introduce a yield curve control, that is to say, maintaining negative interest rate uh, at the short end by policy rate of minus 0.1%, and uh, targeting 10 year JGB rate at around 0%. By so doing, we can uh, uh, achieve uh, appropriate yield curve. The idea was not to uh, flat the yield curve, rather, if not steep, but uh, with some uh, kind of uh, situation so that uh, 20 year or 30 year JGB rate. Uh, to not too low because, uh, as you, you can imagine, 20 uh, or 30 year uh, JGB rates uh, will not affect uh, economic activities directly. Rather, since uh, pension fund or insurance companies uh, are investing hugely in 20, 30 year uh, uh, government bonds, if those interest rates go down, uh, that would affect uh, their long-term uh, uh, 
profitability or long-term uh, <coughs> financial outcome, uh, which might uh, negatively affect uh, consumers' uh, sentiment, uh, particularly for elderly people, so that uh, we <coughs> try to not to reduce 20, 30 year age, rather we try to raise uh, 20, 30 year age with uh, smooth data. And this was quite, uh, in some sense, quite successful. And the inflation rate uh, becomes uh, uh, close to 1%, and growth uh, recovered, and then unemployment rate uh, further declined to 2.4% uh, in 1980, 1919. But then we had uh, COVID-19 pandemic started early 2020. So uh, Bank of Japan introduced the so-called uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, special uh, monetary operations, uh, providing low interest rate money to the banking sector uh, to help uh, uh, low medium sized companies uh, to uh, avoid uh, uh, disruption. And uh, that also helped the uh, economy during the pandemic. But uh, after the pandemic uh, caused the sharp decline of uh, activities and also negative inflation rate. So toward the end of my second term in 2022, we had the uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, during my tenure, uh, the internal rate has had been uh, pretty stable around the uh, one 120 yen plus minus 10 yen to the dollar. But in 2022, as she said, the uh, yen started to depreciate to 150. I still remember when Russia invaded uh, uh, on uh, February 24 uh, of 2022, yen dollar rate was 115 yen to the dollar, so 115. But then started to depreciate uh, substantially, both by two factors. One is, of course, a uh, huge increase of uh, commodity prices, including uh, oil and gas. Japan has been almost 100% dependent on imported gas and oil, so that uh, that affected import prices uh, and affected the uh, uh, trade account, current account, uh, becoming uh, negative. That caused the uh, yen to decrease. Another factor is, of course, uh, the U.S. raised, started to raise interest rate quite sharply in 2022, while we maintained the EU curve control so that the U.S. Japan uh, interest rate differential uh, widened. That uh, made the uh, yen to decrease it further. So at one stage, it uh, reached 150, and the government intervened in the market and uh, recovered to 135. Or but then thereafter, yen uh, depreciated again to 150. So, in some sense, uh, I mean, we try to make the 2% inflation target um, met uh, within two years' time, but it was, it was not possible. And then we had the uh, pandemic, uh, huge negative inflation rate and negative increase in price. But then after the Ukraine war, Inflation rate uh, reached uh, more than 2%. <laughs> 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 so, 
And also, wages started to rise quite sharply. So, ironically, uh, not by 10 year expansionary monetary policy, but by the war in Ukraine, Japanese inflation rate uh, is 2%. And uh, uh, this year's uh, so called uh, Shunto uh, spring offensive uh, has resulted in uh, nearly 3% wage increase, which uh, was the uh, highest in the last uh, 30 years or something like that. Mm. So uh, I can respond to any questions, but uh, I just would like to say that why Professor uh, Weda is still maintaining physical control <laughs> despite the inflation rate over 2%, not only in 2022, but 2023. And also, according to the IMF World Economic Outlook, Japan uh, uh, would have uh, gained 2% uh, plus inflation rate. Rates. 2024. So three consecutive years of inflation rate more than 2%. Uh, despite this situation, uh, Bank of Japan is still uh, somewhat uh, cautious uh, in starting normalization, meaning starting interest rate interest rate hike. So that is uh, because uh, I think uh, Bank of Japan would like to see uh, the wage price uh, uh, nexus uh, be uh, clearly established uh, in Japan. This year, certainly, wages increase and prices increase. Next year, if uh, next year's uh, spring offensive uh, result in uh, gain 3%, uh, uh, close to 3% wage increase, then Bank of Japan would be confident that uh, that 2% uh, inflation target uh, is met, is achieved, sustainable in a sustainable and uh, and uh, stable manner. Then, of course, they start uh, normalizing. So, I have not mentioned much about uh, two other alloys of uh, abenomics, but I must say that uh, it has, I mean, particularly various uh, structural reforms have uh, uh, contributed to a good uh, uh, economic uh, uh, situation in the last 10 years, for instance. In the last 10 years, uh, uh, more than 4 million new jobs were created, particularly for women. And uh, as you know, the Aveno mix included the promotion of uh, women's uh, active engagement in professional uh, life. And that uh, certainly contributed to substantial increase of, uh, of uh, labor force uh, during the last 10 years. And also, uh, Japanese corporate sector currently enjoying the historic high level of profit, higher than that uh, prevailed during the bubble period. Basically, the corporate uh, profit uh, doubled compared with uh, deflationary period. And that, of course, uh, uh, was made possible, not only by uh, expansion in monetary policy, but also by various uh, structural reforms, uh, abenomics uh, promoting. So I think uh, it is not well uh, recognized by uh, by outside economy, mm. but I think uh, various uh, growth strategies, uh, structural reforms, uh, 
jobs and and also investment. Currently, you may know that the, 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 the Japanese economy is doing quite well now. The IMF World Economic Outlook just released in Marrakesh last month shows that, uh, that the Japanese economy will grow by 2% this year. Instead of 1.4%, they uh, focused just three months ago. So the economy is doing uh, quite well, and the investment is increasing substantially. And the uh, and market has become even more tight or tighter. And the uh, Japanese economy is now uh, in a sort of uh, good uh, situation, never seen in the last uh, five years. But again, this is not the by the monetary policy. Partly, <laughs> <laughs> partly, but uh, many other policies, and also uh, again. COVID-19 affected the economy quite serious, but uh, the war has not affected the economy much. Only raised the inflation rate and weight. Here grows continue to be quite strong. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much for your remarks. <laughs> I said that your policies were referred to as an experiment, yeah. but I think your speech has told us how difficult it is when you're not working in a laboratory. <laughs> and you had a clear goal for 2% inflation. You yeah. had comprehensive and creative tools, but then other actors, yeah. consumption, tax hike, yeah other central bankers in China and the United States, yeah. and prices you could not control and oil markets, yeah. and at the end, a pandemic. And it is um, perhaps the best excuse a student <laughs> could have for mixed results that you can't quite have one policy in a controlled yeah. setting and yeah. unexpected things happen. But it is uh, fascinating to hear your discussion of this important period. And I know we have a lot of questions in the room. So I want to open it up. I am going to be very strict. Only one question. <laughs> and it should end in a question. So I would ask everyone out of respect to this very crowded room to ask one question and keep it fairly brief so that we have time to hear from many people. And I will be leading off with our associate, Kenya Amano, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Program on US-Japan Relations, doing research on the political economy of governance and economic policy in Japan. But he has also spent over a decade working at the Bank of Japan in his previous pre-academic time. So if you'd like to lead us off with the first question. Thank you, Doris, for the introduction. So uh, thank you for a great talk and overview of the monetary policy for the last 10 years in the BOJ. So uh, last week was Halloween, and every year in the Halloween, it reminds me of the BOJ's Halloween supplies accommodation <laughs> in 2014. I, at that time, I was, uh, as a representative, of one of our resident office in a New York office, and then I got many phone calls from the <laughs> New York Fed counterparties and the sell side <laughs> to explain and to, you know, uh, introduce that new policy. So I feel a little bit awkward to ask the questions to my former big boss, but my question is, uh, how would you evaluate the central bank's independence under this massive accommodation policies after the financial crisis and the COVID pandemic? Mm. It seems the balance sheet policies, you know, mm. central banks shifted more like fiscal policy, which mm. suggests mm. Um, could easy to be politicized. Mm. In contrast, the debates on the uh, central bank independence in the 1990s, they the debates hasn't um, anticipated these massive accommodations. Mm -hmm. 
Moreover, if you look at the domestic policies, the many democracies faces the challenges such so-called democratic backsliding, erosions, or like uh, effective polarization. So it's really hard to properly manage the democratic governance. In addition, we are living in a world where the geopolitical risks are highly uncertain, which may erode democratic governance, especially in the fiscal policy. So uh, overall, like, you know, how do you think the future of central bank independence and uh, its implications? Mm -hmm. I think uh, central bank independence uh, has uh, two aspects. One is the legal aspect. Another is the kind of political aspect. As far as the legal aspect is concerned, Bank of Japan is completely independent from the government under the 1998 uh, Bank of Japan law. So uh, there's no uh, problem uh, Surrounding central bank independence as far as the bank. The second is the more political thing. First of all, uh, during the last 10 years, uh, every year, uh, twice or three times, I met the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Abe, Prime Minister Suga, Prime Minister Suga. And uh, Whenever I met the prime ministers, uh, I explained the Bank of Japan monetary policy, uh, economic situation, uh, including financial sector situation, and so on and so forth. And uh, whenever I explained those uh, matters to prime ministers, uh, none of them uh, made any critical comment or supportive or requesting or anything like that. It was a bit uh, surprising for me. <laughs> uh, so, uh, in the, as far as the last three, last 10 years are concerned, the uh, political pressure coming from the government on uh, the, the camp. But uh, you are probably concerned about the future of uh, Bank of Japan independence since uh, uh, UJ purchased uh, nearly 50% of JD uh, bills already, and the amount is quite huge. And uh, the total uh, government debt uh, GDP ratio is more than 250%, which is quite quite high. So once uh, Bank of Japan start normalization, meaning uh, raising interest rate. Uh, uh, that burden uh, would uh, increase uh, substantially. Then uh, you may uh, be a bit concerned about the possibility of the government uh, requesting Bank uh, uh, Japan not to raise interest rate so much or asking continuing uh, the purchase of the POJ from the market and so on so forth. Now, that is suppose possible, but I am not quite sure whether it's uh, likely. And secondly, as I said, the uh, Bank of Japan is legally independent. And I I don't think Bank of Japan uh, would uh, accept such a request by the government anyway. <laughs> uh, so this kind of political uh, situation might uh, uh, become reality, but uh, even under such such a situation, I don't think uh, Bank of Japan would uh, uh, accept such a request or demand or pressure from the government. I don't think so. So, as far as the Bank of Japan is concerned, independence is uh, is is not uh, that difficulty. But the 
difficulties public finance. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the government would face a substantial increase of uh, debt burden. Because when I was uh, Vice Minister of Finance for International Affairs uh, around 2000, uh, at that time, the uh, government uh, uh, debt uh, interest payment was something like 10 trillion yen. Now it's only 8 trillion yen, while the outstanding amount of JGB is more than triple. That means that if uh, interest rates uh, become normalized and gradually the JGB's average interest rate uh, goes to 2%, <coughs> government interest uh, payment burden would uh, become 30 trillion yen. It is quite huge. As you know, the government decided to double the defense budget from 5 trillion yen to 10 trillion yen in five years' time. So, 5 trillion yen increase uh, in five years' time. And the government committed itself to increase uh, child care support, uh, something like 3 trillion. So five trillion yen or three trillion, but uh, debt burden is increased from eight trillion yen to thirty trillion yen. But that is quite gradual. How would you found raise interest rate gradually, and also the newly issued uh, government bond or karikai sachi Anyway, new, uh, newly uh, issued government bond would have higher interest rate. So that the impact would not be immediate, but uh, gradual. So maybe five to 10 years time, uh, that would uh, substantially increase. But this is not uh, the, the it is not called by the government. Bank of Japan low interest rate uh, in order to revive the economy and uh, overcome inflation. And uh, during the low interest rate the period, the government increased and increased the uh, deficit and the uh, uh, It is the government. <laughs> yes, we cannot expect too much from bank. Yes. Yeah. All right, we have many yeah. questions in the room. I will uh, spend a minute here. Short one question. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, my question is uh, how the Bank of Japan balances its desire for inflation and against depreciation. Um, and specifically, I was curious if you could talk about the you know numbers that you look at. You talk a lot about the two percent inflation goal, mm -hmm. and I was wondering about the one hundred fifty yen to one USD uh, exchange rate. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the the, the uh, I mean always exchange rate uh, prediction uh, is going to. <laughs> I have been uh, I have been involved in exchange uh, exchange rate uh, uh, management uh, intervention and so on so forth and exchange rate prediction is extremely difficult. Uh, the only theory which has been uh, tested uh, is uh, so called uh, uh, PPT or which is uh, quite uh, uh, robust, uh, that is to say in 20, 30 years time, if you have higher inflation rate, then your currency would uh, depreciate against the low inflation country. That is uh, quite uh, robust, uh, but of course, uh, predicting uh, 20 or 30 year uh, inflation rate is as difficult as predicting 20, Time of exchange rate move. 
So, interested differential and so on and so forth, they, they, they appear to be uh, correct when you select appropriate the uh, interest rate differential. Sometimes short-term interest, sometimes covered interest, sometimes long-term interest, sometimes immediate. So it, it, it has no predictive power, I think. So exchange rate is uh, difficult, but my hunch is that uh, 150 is under variation. And uh, uh, once uh, market uh, becomes uh, more rational, I think, so easily, yen would appreciate to 120 yen. So I'm not much concerned about the differentiation. Anyway, it's a temporary one. Next question. Let's see, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> oh, hands up high. Yeah, I can. Uh, Correct to all questions and then I can answer. <laughs> okay, let's take three yeah. questions yeah, so that we can let you collect your yeah. thoughts. Um, I've been going this side, so I'm going to first ask um, right here. Um, so we might distinguish between mm -hmm. a uh, cost push source of an inflationary shock mm -hmm. and a demand pull source yeah. of an inflationary shock. Yeah. Yeah. And from what I can tell from your talk, yeah. the Bank of Japan and also uh, the government through structural change and fiscal mm. policy mm. spent 10 years trying to generate a demand pull shock mm. only for the cost push of a commodity <laughs> price, <laughs> price <laughs> and more uh, to give you your inflationary target. Mm. So my mm. question is, is the Bank of Japan indifferent between a cost push and a demand pull source mm. of a wage price spiral originating, mm -hmm. and should it be indifferent given the historical example of the mm -hmm. 1970s? Mm -hmm. Great question, hold your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Everyone raise your hands high so I can see. Okay, straight back. Uh, given that mm -hmm. we can't expect too much from mm -hmm. uh, central bankers as the data mentions, what mm -hmm. would you expect Japanese governments to do for, uh, for the economic improvement of Japan? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. What role do you think that the demographic situation in Japan will play for central banking for the next few decades? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, among uh, these countries, uh, European countries have the highest inflation rate. Uh, you know, the Eurozone has the uh, last year double digit inflation. Uh, Germany maybe eight percent, France maybe six seven percent, but uh, all the countries had more than twenty percent inflation last year, and uh, ECB uh, tightened monetary policy. But uh, I must say that the European inflation has been largely caused by supply constraint. Uh, Ukraine war almost stopped. Uh, uh, Provided, providing uh, uh, cheap uh, fossil fuels to European countries and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course, uh, commodity prices went up quite sharply. So European inflation is basically cost pushed. American inflation is uh, demand pushed as well as cost pushed. Demand pushed because, uh, of course, uh, during the and then period, the government provided a huge amount of subsidies to households, and households didn't spend. But after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, subsided, uh, of course, uh, consumption boom has come, very strong consumption. On the other hand, uh, during the COVID-19 period, uh, a lot of uh, workers were laid off, and uh, not all of them have come back. Mm -hmm. So the supply potential has reduced while demand increased substantially, so that 78% uh, inflation uh, in the United States. Now, Japanese inflation is almost 100% caused by post push. 
uh, basically import price hikes. Milk price increase as well as yen depreciation caused the uh, price yield to rise at one stage, 4%. But now it's uh, 9% or something because uh, import prices have been declining quite significantly. So uh, in that sense, uh, Japanese uh, inflation is basically uh, import price hike uh, causing inflation. But on the other hand, as I said, uh, the kind of uh, norm, kind of social uh, norm of uh, inflation, no wage increase, that norm has been almost destroyed because of the huge uh, input price hike transferred to some uh, consumer price increase at one stage reaching 4%, and uh, as I said, the wage increase reaching close to 3%. So wage price uh, nexus uh, has uh, some sort of positive for the first time, maybe in the last 30 years. So this was caused by cost push to inflation, uh, whether this would uh, continue or not, that is a major, major issue. If, uh, as I said, the next year wages would uh, continue to rise, then of course this uh, uh, negative uh, <coughs> loop would be completely destroyed, and that means that uh, that the two percent inflation rate could be. Uh, achieved in a sustainable and stable manner. So anyway, Bank of Japan has been carefully analyzing the cause of inflation and the uh, and, uh, future of inflationary development. And as I said, uh, this stage, uh, despite substantial effort by the Bank of Japan and also the government, to increase uh, demand. Demand increased substantially, but at the same time, supply also increased, as I said. Four million new jobs, four million new uh, workforce uh, was uh, put into the market. And that made uh, economic growth uh, recovered, but at the same time, uh, raises and Price inflation. A government, what can do? I think uh, from now on, the role of the central bank would be uh, normalized and not much. And the government can do, uh, I think, uh, not just uh, supporting uh, innovation, uh, new technologies. Uh, digital uh, technology or green technology and so forth. But also, I, my personal view is that we have to accept the substantial number of foreign uh, workers, foreign uh, technicians uh, to come to Japan. Because the uh, Japanese population is uh, declining uh, about half a million every year. That means that uh, unless we can accept uh, nearly half a million foreign workers every year, our potential growth rate will continue to be quite, quite low. So the government uh, policy uh, Supporting uh, innovation and so on so forth uh, would continue to be important, but at the same time, I think, uh, because this is not uh, political consensus in Japan, but uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, foreign uh, technicians, foreign uh, IT uh, experts, and so on and so forth must be accepted uh, 
to be a democratic. Uh, again, I think government is trying to uh, uh, increase uh, total fertility rate, uh, but even if the government is successful, the positive impact will be felt only after 20 to 30 years time. So immediate uh, impact will be almost nothing. So demographic uh, issue is quite important. Uh, in the long run, the government uh, may be able to do something. Um, if you look at Nordic countries, they have the uh, low birth rate, but now they have quite high birth rate and the population is not uh, declining. Uh, so uh, this is uh, really long-term uh, issue, I think. We're almost to the end of our time, yeah. but I want to add <laughs> one last question in the room, and I have one online. Masako, <laughs> did you have a question? Oh, right, right next to you. Oh, thank you, Professor. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how uh, the U.S. economy, particularly the fiscal uh, trajectory, mm -hmm. and the recent rise in long-term rate mm -hmm. might impact mm -hmm. revenue policy. Mm -hmm. And the online question from Yasuhiro Kamimura asks, it's surprising to see average real GDP growth before your term and during your period are identical. Can we say <laughs> Abenomics worked? <laughs> it's two tough questions and we are nearly at the end of time. So yeah, you can yeah, yeah. choose how you want to answer. Yeah, yeah actually, the, 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 the last question um, is uh, very, something interesting, but the uh, Quite difficult question. Yes, it is true that uh, the, the deflation period uh, growth rate uh, on average was uh, something like uh, uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 percent, or something like that. And even uh, last 10 years, uh, growth rate was about uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 percent. So uh, actually, there is no uh, uh, increase of uh, trend growth uh, after that is very true. But uh, if you look at uh, this uh, main code of what is the growth rate was forty uh, seventeen. And uh, that uh, lasted only two years. And at this moment, as I said, the Japanese economy is growing quite substantially, uh, well over potential growth rate. And uh, potential growth rate uh, is now uh, slightly less than 1%, but uh, compared with the last uh, 30 years, uh, Maybe only about uh, 0 0.5 or 0 0.6 percent. Uh, last year, average growth rate was also 0 0.6 percent. But at this moment, uh, potential growth rate has uh, accelerated uh, apparently. And uh, so uh, I'm um, more hopeful about the future of the Japanese economic growth. Uh, the U.S. Uh, U.S. economy, as I said, I'm quite uh, optimistic about the, the U.S. economy. As you may know, uh, the, the IMF uh, raised uh, U.S. economy growth forecast for 2023 to 2.1%. Uh, 2024, 1.5%, 2025, 1.8%. And the US potential growth rate is uh, 1.5 to 2%. So uh, 23, 24, 25, the US economy can grow at around the potential growth rate. Uh, so in that sense, full employment will continue. While inflation rate gradually declined, according to the IMF project, uh, 2024, 2.8%, 2025, 2.4%. Uh, 
so uh, I must say that uh, despite some pessimism among uh, U.S. economists, uh, I'm quite uh, optimistic about the uh, U.S. economic growth in the short to medium term. And uh, of course, uh, it is based on very strong, uh, innovative uh, uh, power in the industry and also population increase. U.S. population uh, is increasing by 0.5% annually. Uh, Japan declining 0.5% annually. So that uh, the, the potential growth rate difference between U.S. and Japan uh, is largely caused by 1% gap of population dynamics between U.S. and Japan. Well, U.S. potential growth rate may be 1.5 to 2%. Japanese potential growth rate 0.5 to 1%. So total factor productivity uh, between Japan and U.S. Uh, has not been so much different. So in the short run, the U.S. economy is doing quite well, despite some <laughs> pessimism about uh, among uh, American economists and uh, politicians. And uh, even in the long run, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, population dynamics and, uh, and uh, innovative power appear, appear to be quite uh, strong and consistent, so that uh, even in the long run, U.S. economy is uh, likely to maintain the status of the largest economy. On the other hand, Chinese economy has been declining uh, its uh, potential growth. According to IMF economists, the uh, Chinese economic growth this year may be 5%, but by 2030, Chinese uh, potential growth rate would uh, go down to 3 to 3.5 percent. So, um, very difficult for the Chinese economy to become bigger than the US economy. <laughs> Maybe possible, but uh, per capita wise, uh, it's almost impossible for China to overcome the I'd like to thank our speaker for talking on a range of <laughs> economic policies from direct experience to predicting difficult markets. And thank you so much for taking the time and all of you who are joining us.